All right, we're going to finish up with chapter 2.5 and 2.6. They're both rather short. Let's start with our review, though. So let's determine the biosafety level of uh, the following pathogen. So Agent A, whatever it is, can cause severe disease, including death, in some patients. Uh, it can cause disease by either inhalation or ingestion. And it can be treated, though, with a readily available antibiotic doxycycline. So, do we think it's biosafety level 1, 2, 3, or 4? Remember what each of those meant? Uh, pause the video if you need to. Okay, so let's look at what happens here. Uh, it could cause death, but there is a treatment. Okay, so level 4 was causes can cause death, but there's no treatment. Uh, level three was might cause death, might be toxic, but there could be a treatment. So that's a good fit. Level two was probably not uh, in a healthy individual, probably won't kill them. Um, and there's lots of treatment. And biosafety level one was like, you know, not harmful at all. So our best bet here would be biosafety level three because we do have antibiotics, but it could uh, cause death. Okay, in uh, chapter 2.5, we're going to talk a little bit about, about host factors in disease. So, so what things about the host might put them at risk for a disease? Uh, particularly, we're going to talk about humans in this case, how our behavior um, could impact susceptibility to disease. So long and short, how does health and lifestyle contribute to the probability of getting an infectious disease? Well, there's several different factors here. Uh, one of them, right, is age. Sad fact, right? But when you're very young, under three, your immune system is not fully developed, so you are susceptible to disease. And as you get very old, over 60, you become much more susceptible to disease. Uh, luckily, with our COVID-19 pandemic, this group, this young group, did not uh, really uh, was not really susceptible, but we did see a large number of elderly people die from COVID-19. Um, the host might have genetic susceptibilities. They might have specific receptors that make them more likely to uh, get hurt by a bacteria or virus. We'll talk a bit about this later. This is a bit more complicated. Host hygiene and behavior. This is a big one. Hand washing and sanitizing, base coverings, right? Proper cooking of food. We talked about the fecal oral route. Um, sexual activity. These can all lead to increasing your chances of getting an infectious disease. Nutrition and exercise. If you're malnourished, uh, obese, um, you are at higher risk of uh, contracting an infectious disease because your immune system might, might not be at its peak. Also, do you have pre-existing conditions, chronic infections, autoimmune diseases, cancer, um, innate or acquired immunosuppression, right? HIV kills T cells, which are part of the immune system and leads to AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Um, that means that you are more likely to get an infection from something that a healthy individual would just fight off easily. But if you're immunosuppressed, you can't fight it. Occupation is a big one. I got to talk about this one because most of you are interested in being a healthcare worker. Unfortunately, that puts you at higher risk for contracting infectious diseases because when people are sick with infectious diseases, they go to healthcare facilities. Um, so proper protective equipment is key there. Also, laboratory personnel that work with infectious diseases. Agricultural workers, they come into contact with animals. Also hunters, right? Uh, not only do they come into contact with animals, they're actually like slaughtering them in a lot of cases, which can expose them to pathogens. And of course, sex workers are also at high risk of exposure due to a lot of direct physical contact. And as we talked about here, right, the pre-existing conditions, immune status is a big one and that immunopathogenesis. Immune compromised individuals can often be hurt by uh, simple infections, things that we would consider simple infections. They can be deadly to these individuals. And also our immune system itself can cause collateral damage. We'll see a case later in the course where uh, uh, hepatitis virus 
infects the liver and the immune system starts killing liver cells and that causes cirrhosis of the liver. Um, so this can be a, a big one. Okay, uh, make sure you know some examples of those. I think uh, most of that makes a lot of sense, but it's always good to think about it. Let's finish up by talking about kind of global change and emerging infectious diseases. So how is civilization and the expansion of uh, human uh, life, right, impacting infectious diseases? And how can climate change potentially uh, alter infectious disease patterns? We're going to keep it simple. New infectious diseases are constantly emerging or re-emerging. Uh, an emerging one is one that recently appeared in a population. SARS-CoV-2, our COVID-19 causing virus, that's an emerging disease, right? Interactions between humans and bats led to that emergence. A re-emerging disease um, is something that is a known disease, but the incidents have gone down, but now they're increasing or the range is increasing. Unfortunately, we're seeing a large number of vaccine preventable diseases like measles, mumps, rubella, uh, because people are choosing, for whatever reasons, not to vaccinate their children, they are leading to the reemergence of these diseases. And we've seen uh, several outbreaks in recent years of measles. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's punishing children through no fault of their own. That Now they have to experience that disease. Uh, we'll see some case studies of this later in the course, but this is a big problem, right? Uh, people get complacent. No one has died from polio for many, many years, or very few people have. So uh, people aren't vaccinating against polio, and we're seeing it start to reemerge. We saw a case in New York recently. Global increases in death and disease, they're often connected with human activities, right? particularly ones that bring us closer to disease reservoirs. As our population expands, as people move out into the wilderness, basically, uh, we come into contact with animal reservoirs and vectors. Um, also, as we change the earth and travel around it, air travel, right? You can go from one place on the earth and in 24 hours be, you know, completely opposite side of the world. Um, so, diseases can spread quite rapidly. And as climate changes... We're going to move and animals are going to move and things are going to move and that's going to bring new things into contact and we're going to see emerging diseases occur. Okay, so temperature change, drought, talked about that one a little bit or excessive rain, right? That uh, particularly flooding, flooding can lead to uh, emerging diseases um, as the fecal oral route happens. Um, water gets contaminated, deforestation, urban sprawl. Um, this is a complex topic, right? We're not going to dive too deep into it, but think about how uh, humans moving is potentially leading to increased uh, risk of disease. Okay, that is it for chapter two. Uh, we got one more chapter in this unit, chapter three.